Hey guys, how's it going? Today we are going to continue with explaining the lore behind all of the Bond CEs. Today we're going to be doing the Archers. Alright, let's go. Who else could start this off but Emiya? Emiya's Bond CE is simply recounting the tale of his current status in life. Emiya became a member of the Counterforce in the hopes of being able to save as many lives as possible. However, he was instead made into a simple tool to wipe out people whom the Force deemed to be threats to humanity. The CE attempts to encapsulate that feeling of bitterness that he feels but keeps his continued will to keep trying. Gilgamesh shows us his key to the Gate of Babylon. This is a deviation from real history. History, naturally. The key is a constantly changing object that only Gilgamesh himself can use to open the gates of Babylon. The gates themselves grew notorious enough for them to become a mystic and gradually accumulate more and more treasure. Even if Gil were kind enough to give you the key to access the vault, you wouldn't be able to because you don't know how to actually open it, so it would just be as useful as a stone. Atalanta's Bonsi is the Golden Apples. During the foot race for her hand in marriage, Aphrodite gave the apples to Hippomenes, who then used them to slow down Atalanta. This is what would eventually lead to her marriage, but for one reason or another, depending on which myth you are reading, Atalanta and Hippomenes are turned into male and female lions because the Greeks believed that they would not be able to have sex then. Robin's Bonsi is his noble phantasm, no face, may king. While you can be forgiven for thinking that this name sequence is just a translation error that they just kind of run with, it is actually grammatically correct. The no faces aspect is explained in the Bonsi itself saying that he wore the hood to hide his face and that the role of being Robin Hood was one that was passed from person to person. As such, there is no singular face or face at all for the Robin Hood name. The May King is actually about the May Day Festival. Normally, there's a crowning of a May Queen, but there are sometimes May Kings. But as this is a celebration of nature, and Robin himself is viewed as an aspect of nature, he takes up the role of being the king of the natural world, the May King. Thus, he is the no-face May King. Uriel's and Stenos, for that matter, have no basis in history at all. Both are simply manifestations of their weapon of choice. In the case of Uriel, is a golden bow not dissimilar to the bow of Cupid. The reasoning for that is because of her godly charm, said to be able to captivate even the most cold-hearted of men. Naturally, Arash has ties to the meat that he supposedly became that shot across the night sky. The issue is that how it is presented in the CE is that there are seven lights in the sky instead of just Arash, with the flavor text being Arash feeling confused on the subject. Now Arash is difficult enough to get research done on as is, because he is very much a local hero, but the seven colors across the night sky may be representative of a rainbow. This is because the rainbow was seen as the bow of the pre-Islamic god Kaza. So what that may allude to in the CE is that Arash's prayers were heard and that he became the arrow of the god to save his nation. Orion's bond CE is a stellar tri-star belt. After Orion was killed, be it by poisoning or accidentally by Artemis, Orion's body was committed to the stars by Zeus, where it became the constellation we now know as Orion the Hunter. I would reckon that as far as constellations go, this one, the Pleiades, and the Dippers are the most famous. David gives to you the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark is one of the most fascinating things in the Bible for several reasons, but partially because we are given the exact instructions on how to make it, down to the measurements and adornings. The Ark itself housed the sacred tablets of the Ten Commandments, and anyone who touched the Ark without the Lord's permission was directly smoted by him. When the Ark itself was captured by the Philistines, not but misfortune fell upon the places where it was brought. In an act of defiance against God, they left the Ark in the temple of the deity Dagon before a statue. When they returned the following morning, the statue was prostrated in front of the Ark, and soon after the plague took many of the people of the city. At present, we do not know where the Ark is, but we can assume that a holy vessel called the Ark of the Covenant did actually exist. The real Ark would become lost to history around 570 BCE after the Babylonians ransacked Jerusalem. It is still debated whether the Ark was taken to Babylon or if it was hidden away and just simply lost to time. Nobu is a combination of her own gun of choice, the matchlock, and the influence that it had. Nobu is the one who essentially made the case that guns are not just useful on the battlefield, but the next step in warfare altogether. At the time, guns were viewed as a powerful weapon for sure, but one that took too long to reload and became virtually useless up close. As such, the debate as to whether guns or bows were superior raged on even during Musashi's time around 60 years later, with Musashi remarking that each had a place on the battlefield. Nobu's ambition and willingness to attempt to revolutionize Japanese warfare tactics clearly paid off and firearms became a mainstay in Japanese warfare ever since. No, Tesla did not invent and use a real-life Infinity Gauntlet. This is supposed to be a representation of the great deed that Tesla did in becoming the modern Prometheus bringing not fire, but electricity from the heavens and giving it to mankind. I have a few gripes about this claim, which fate touts a lot, because the history of the discovery and utilization of electricity involves a shit ton of people, but for now, I'll let it slide. I'm still not as brushed up on the Mahabharata as I should be, so forgive me for leaving out details. Arjuna was born into royalty, and as such, led the life of a royal. He had all that he could possibly ask for, a great amount of wealth and several beautiful brides, yet he still wanted more and took several risks that could have gotten him killed or slandered his family's name for what seems to be like his own enjoyment. I don't 
don't know exactly which event in his life the CE is referring to, but his risk taking as a whole will have to suffice for now. This one's kind of a fan service CE for those of you who have played Hollow Ataraxia because in it, Kid Gills is the owner and manager of Waku Waku Zaboon, or as it is translated into English, Exciting Splash Water Park. I love Buildies because it has the duality to it being both cinematic and historically accurate. The best way to view the CE is as follows. This CE and its description is the closing scene to the Billy the Kid movie. The opening scene is the historically accurate one that goes as follows. Billy was at a saloon when he got into an argument with a man named Francis Cahill, who was known to be a bully to Billy. Cahill struck up an argument with Billy, who in turn insulted him, leading to the pair fighting and winding up on the floor. In a last-ditch effort to get the much larger man off of him, Billy managed to get his revolver and shot Cahill before fleeing. This was the first of the 21 people he'd killed during his life. The ending of Tristan's life is a bit complex, so I'm going to attempt to keep it short here. There are two Isolates, who I'm absolutely saying wrong in this story. It is the Irish healer Isolate and Tristan's wife, Isolate of the White Hands. Tristan had been poisoned by a lance while fighting six knights, and the only one who could cure it was Isolate, the Irish healer. So he sent a friend of his to go and get her in return with white sails if Isolate was with them and black sails if she was not. As Tristan was in so much pain, he couldn't get up from his bed to see the colors of the sails, so he asked his wife, Isolate of the White Hands, to tell him what color the sails were. She was jealous of the Irish Isolate and so lies to Tristan about the colors of the sails, which were white, claiming that they were black. Tristan dies of a broken heart, believing that he has been betrayed, and when the Irish Isolet sees that she was too late, she dies on top of his corpse. After the defeat of the demonic centipede, the dragon god of the lake was so overjoyed that she gifted Toto with a number of magical items. These included a bolt of silk that never ran out and was of the finest quality, a bag of rice that was always full of the most delicious rice, and a red copper pan that always cooked delicious meals. The most notable among these are his rice bag, which he became famous for because instead of hoarding the gift that he received, he shared them with the people around him so that they could rejoice in his good fortune with him. This is why Toto is the Chad of Chads in Caldea. Archer Artorias is a trophy stylized in the form of a penguin and similar to a Holy Grail. According to the description, Artoria got obsessed with Water Blitz, a survival game on the beach, and won this cup for being the best at it. When did this happen during the events of Summer 1? No clue. Supposedly, this occurred in Hawaii on Waikiki Beach, so maybe it has alluded to Summer 3 all along? I have no idea. This is just Anne and Mary going off to use the beach showers. The bond CE is that they try to drag you into it, but because that's kind of boring to be the only lord, did you know that pirates rarely bathed them and then when they did, it was with seawater and used almost exclusively on their privates? This is the shared pain spell applied to Chloe and Prisma Ilya by Rin. Chloe was attempting to kill Ilya so that she could change places with her, so the spell made it so that any harm that came to Ilya would be applied to Chloe as well. The likely reason for why this is the Bonsi is because it represents the bond between the two sisters or something. Ishtar's poses a bit of a problem to me. My research is turning up nothing at all for a sacred Warhammer. It really doesn't even appear in any of her iconography either, and it isn't mentioned in any of the texts I'm currently looking at. What I did find instead is that serpents, or rather snakes, are what is most important in this motif. Gilgamesh has an aversion to snakes due to one snagging away the herb of immortality away from him, so the decision to use snakes works on that angle. The other one is that it may be representative of, of Musmahu, the seven-headed serpent of Sumerian myth that was slain by the hero Ninuratha. Moriarty's is his best-selling book of mathematics titled The Dynamics of an Asteroid. The book was essentially Moriarty's magnum opus and hailed as being so mathematically impeccable that no critics were able to find any faults with it. Never forget that Moriarty's true evil comes from his understanding of algebra. Emya Alter gives us an explanation as to what his guns are, named Kansho and Bakuya respectively. The original source were Archer Emiya's weapons of choice, and were covered in spells of warding to increase their effectiveness. Here, Emiya Alter has thrown away his feelings of favorites and altered his swords into firearms, which are capable of firing broken phantasms. According to himself, he doesn't care what weapons he uses so long as it can do the job. HPB Archer gives us the modified version of the minigun Nyarf, which was made originally as a magical weapon by Edison and Tesla. The version that we are given was made so that even a normal human being like us could fire it. So Tomoe's is sad and tragic in its own way. What is presented are the possible paths that Tomoe took after her husband told her to leave him to die during the Genpei War. The first incarnation is the one where she did leave him, who becomes a nun and then eventually a spirit that wept at the loss of her husband. The second incarnation is the one in which she stayed and fought regardless, dying with her burning love for her husband beside him. The third incarnation, I think, is the one that we see before us right now, who actually knows what happened and remembers the events vividly, but plans to keep them a secret. The God of Winter and Sheep, Altera the Santa's Bond CE, is more fan service than anything. It shows the exact same streak that she appeared as when entering Earth, but is defined as being a shooting star to wish upon. I don't have the time to explain exactly why the CE is so tragic, so I'll break it down to you like this. Karn no Kyokai diehards, please forgive me for this gross oversimplification of an incredibly tragic character. Fujino was born with telekinetic abilities, but her dad thought that they were too dangerous for modern society, and so gave her a bunch of pills to suppress them, which had the overdosing effect that suppressed her pain receptors. The submarine itself on the bridge held a special memory that she had for her senpai who helped her when she had sprained her ankle, and the significance of the rain comes back into play close to the end of her story in K&K, &K, which I highly recommend that you go and watch for yourself because it is fucking sad. Chiron's is reminiscent of his own legends and myth as the great teacher of heroes. It remarks on the oldest adage of teaching that exists, that being that you never stop learning. 
Regardless of what you do, you will learn something from the experience, even if what you learn is just infinitesimal. Napoleon's is a mixture of real life quandary and how rumor affects servants in the Fate universe. Everyone who knows about Napoleon knows that there are a handful of lies told about him that are spread as propaganda, the most well known one being that he was short. However, certain parts of his legends and rumors seem to have shaped Napoleon during his manifestation as a servant. The real question with this is then what makes this Napoleon the real Napoleon? The game offers no explanation for this. Summer Johns is her beloved dolphins that she insists are sea angels and is trying to actively arm with stolen armor and weapons from other servants. Yes, that is true. However, dolphins themselves could be seen as similar to angels in the way that the Valkyrie are, because the ancient Greeks considered them to be the messengers of the gods. The eulogized shot of William Tell, a mark against tyranny since the 14th century. Tell was from the town of Uri, and one day passed the town of Altdorf, Switzerland, which had been taken over by the tyrannical man, Gessler. To make sure that all in the town vowed loyalty to him, he hung his hat from the tree and made everybody who entered the town bow before it. Tell and his son Walter refused to do so, and as so, were arrested. Gessler offered them freedom only if Tell could shoot an apple off of Walter's head. Tell managed to do so, but then Gessler noticed that he had taken out two bolts for the shot. Initially reluctant, it took Gessler promising not to kill Tell or his son to say that if he had missed, he had planned to kill Gessler with it. Gessler then tried to give him a life sentence, but this isn't an episode behind the servant, so I'm going to stop there. Also, I found that the first instance of the story is written by Hans Schlieper from Landscriber, and it made me laugh. Alright, so Ashes is kind of weird. First off, let me give a thank you to Prahashara in the Discord for helping me out with this one as best that he could. The connection between Ash and the Chakram, which is likely meant to be the Sudarshana Chakram is near non-existent. This Chakram is a favorite weapon of Vishnu, but in the Mahabharata it is wielded by the 8th avatar of Vishnu, Krishna. Krishna's connection with Ash is that Krishna is the one who cursed him with immortality and removed the gem from his head that caused it to always ooze a foul-smelling liquid for eternity. So perhaps the best way to look at this CE is less of him trying to claim the treasure of godhood, but rather him trying to claim forgiveness for his actions. This would make sense in tone with the rest of his CE's description, where he takes the stance of wanting to be a protector rather than an attacker, which he absolutely was in the Mahabharata. Paris's Bonsi is a flashback of what would eventually become the start of the Trojan War. The war began out of an argument between Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena over who was the most beautiful. This came about because they neglected to invite the god Eris, the goddess of strife, to a celebration, so she threw a golden apple of strife at them that had the words, for the most beautiful, etched on it. They eventually came to realize that arguing among deities was going to get them nowhere, so they brought in an unrelated third party, the fair and honest youth, Paris. Here he had to make a decision without a right answer, please one goddess in anger to others. So, as the name of the CE says, he ought to think carefully. Not much really to go on here other than to relive the days of procrastination and the realization that battles come in many shapes and forms. From games to manga deadlines, the battles never truly stop. Chains is weird in its own right. The cheerleader thing is more a fetish bait than anything else, but the real historical value comes from the description of the CE. Jane in history was a bit of a vagabond. She traveled from place to place, never truly settling down, and eventually died doing what she loved, drinking. So if nothing else, we can determine that at least a grain of history is in this Servant vs. Rendition of her. Also go watch my video on her. Nothing here holds any historical weight as I have come to accept from Santa's servants. This one is kind of fun though because it plays on the idea that Nightingale's neglecting to acknowledge her part as Santa. She's instead playing it all off as though it were a dream. I don't have much more to say on this one because it's exactly the same as the Artemis Orion one, just without the Ursa Minor painted over it. Says is cute and not just for how it looks. Say's famed work, The Pillow Book, was essentially a journal marking the daily lives of court life during the Heian era of Japan. It was somewhat mundane and included the gossips around the court and the like, which from a historical perspective is amazing to have documentation of. It's something so small, like how we record our friends and family. Here we see Say doing that once again, but in a revamped modern version of it. Some things will always be the same. Ilias Bonsi is a snippet of the summer event we spent with her, where she became the star of the show for having the best panic expressions in the entire game. This Bonsi celebrates that fact by having Ruby swap out the cute magical girl anime out with a slasher flick. Ruby is weirdly persistent about getting Ilya to watch it. Ruby is really weird as a character. Nobukatsu's features a singular red spider lily. The red spider lily is symbolic of death. Fittingly, it makes an appearance on most of Nobu's art in the game, as well as around a certain portent of death. No, not that one this one. The flower was placed on the grave of Nobukatsu and his death is meant to symbolize the start of Nobu's rampage through Japan. While I'm sure there is something more to this one that it will be explained in Lost Belt 6, the real fascination with shoes likely comes from Sith actually not having feet. The original Banshi had goat hooves, so Sith finding something pretty that could be worn to hide her feet falls in line with her personality a bit. Nothing of historical relevance here, Anastasia just wants to be spoiled by you and pretend to be a couple. It's more of a desire for the future or a scene from the summer event that we didn't actually get to see. After Zenobia's failed attempt to rebel against the oppression of the Roman Empire, she was taken as a trophy to be marched in the streets in chains of gold. She was paraded through the streets of many Roman cities with these chains, and then eventually would die in captivity shortly after. Go watch my video on her in Boudicca for more information. Tame Tomo is infamous for the anecdote 
clip that comes from the Hogan Monogatari. In it, he is described as having a left arm longer than the right one, either by 4 or 5 inches depending on the account, enabling him to fire a bow much stronger. Tametomo was being hunted at one point by the Imperials, and was discovered on an island that he had taken refuge on. He thought that he was not strong enough to resist them, so he stabbed his son to death to prevent his capture, and then wanted to fire a final arrow at his enemies. He knocked it and sunk an entire ship in one blow. This actually scared off the Imperials from chasing him for some time. So on that note, thanks for watching. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe and let me know in the comments. Check out my links down below from my Discord, Twitch, and Twitter, but for now guys, keep your chin up, peace.